Mr. Hastavik's online lecture series, lecture number nine, The Great Depression and the American Impact. Thus far, we've studied a great deal about what the Great Depression meant from the big picture perspective. How it affected politics nationally, how it affected employment and production nationally. But what did it mean to be alive in the 1930s? How did the Great Depression affect different people across the country? How did individuals cope with hardship during the Depression? Well, that's what we're going to explore here. We will look at photos showing the Depression impacting American lives. We will listen to music inspired by and written about living in the Depression. We will see firsthand how Americans coped with the hardship of the 1930s. I strongly recommend, before you go through with the rest of this lecture, looking up the lyrics to some of the music that I feature. Woody Guthrie's Dust Bowl Refugee, Bruce Springsteen's Ghost of Tom Joad, Robert Johnson's Ramblin' on My Mind, Harry McClintock's Big Rock Candy Mountain, and Bing Crosby's Pennies from Heavens. The Dust Bowl. Arguably, the Depression hit farmers the hardest. Overproduction, which drove down prices for farm goods in the 1920s, led to massive eviction and foreclosure in the 1930s. Farmers in the Midwest were especially hard hit, as farming in that part of the nation had always been a struggle. The heartland of our country was once covered in wide, spacious grasslands. The soil was not accustomed to the demands of routine agriculture, and eking out a living off of the land meant a constant battle to squeeze out every ounce of produce possible. This overproduction led to a gradual destruction of the quality of the soil. Further, after the Great Crash in 1929, thousands upon thousands of farmers found they couldn't pay their mortgages, and banks immediately foreclosed. As a result, hundreds of thousands of acres were either left uncultivated or unable to be cultivated in the Midwest. As this land lay fallow for years since the late 1920s, the soil eventually dried up. And when, in 1933, a series of powerful windstorms struck Oklahoma, northern Texas, and Kansas, millions of tons of that dead soil was kicked up into the sky, creating what became known as the Dust Bowl. For over four years, the dust from a circular area of our country over 400 miles wide circulated in the lower atmosphere. This dust was then strewn across the eastern half of our country. The dust clouds were so thick that on March 30, 1936, the light from the midday sun was completely blocked out in New Mexico. In November 1933, dust clouds poured down upon crowds gathered at the World's Fair in Chicago, Illinois. Dust covered the grounded airplanes in Boston in May of 1934, and planes were collecting dust on their wings at an altitude of 20,000 feet. In New York at the same time, dust had caused humidity levels to drop from their normal 57% down to 34%. Boats over 500 miles out in the Atlantic Ocean found dust gathering on their decks. It's no small wonder, therefore, that the Midwest, Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Texas, and the Dakotas were the worst places to live at this time. Not only was there little work, one could hardly breathe due to all the dust kicking around. As a result, thousands upon thousands of former farm families packed up their belongings onto their old beat-up Ford or Chevy trucks and left. Most families headed out west. Thanks to wind patterns caused by the Rocky Mountains, the western half of the country was not affected by the dust storms. Further, California by the 1930s had quietly grown into an agricultural giant. It's no secret that the San Joaquin Valley in which we live is one of the most fertile patches of land in the United States, if not the world, so naturally many of these fa farm families headed into California in search of work and hope. Now, unfortunately, California was also hard hit by the Depression. Sacramento saw 27,000 of its own citizens out of work, nearly 50% unemployment. While farming and agriculture were booming, there simply wasn't enough work to go around for all Californians, let alone for the Dust Bowl refugees, or, in the more vulgar vernacular of the time, the Okies, who started streaming into California by the thousands in the mid-1930s. The migration wasn't completely unplanned. Farmers and agricultural businesses lured most of the Dust Bowl refugees out west with the promise of work. While this promise was genuine, many farmers even stopped using modern farm equipment so they could help put more people to work picking and planting. 
Landowners knew their ads would produce a surplus of demand for work, which would give them the power to keep wages very low. Two heroes of the Dust Bowl refugees emerged in the 1930s. John Steinbeck, who was already a prominent author from Salinas, California, would write his most important and enduring book chronicling the trials and travails of the Jode family as they left their home in the Midwest and tried to find a new life in California. Steinbeck documented how the migrant workers faced harassment from police, false promises and swindles from farm owners, competition and violence from other migrant workers, and even the wrath of nature itself. Woody Guthrie was a singer-songwriter born in Oklahoma in 1912. By age 19, Guthrie was married and working on a farm in Texas when the Dust Bowl forced him to uproot and abandon his family and follow the Okies out west. Moving out to California, Guthrie documented and sang about the hardships and stories of his fellow migrants. He would make money, or in some case, just meals, by going from migrant farm camp to farm camp throughout the mid-30s, singing his songs while playing his guitar that sported the now infamous slogan, This Machine Kills Fascists. Guthrie's music reflected the popular attitude among many migrants that they were the people the government forgot. These people lost everything, their homes, their income, their way of life, and in many cases, even their lives. And they put the blame for their problems square on the shoulders of state and federal politicians, especially since federal relief seemed to find them too little too late. Due largely to his popularity as a modern-day bard, singing about the tribulations of the poor farmers, making them heroic, if not martyrs in his music, Guthrie became very popular among the underground. His sound and writing style would become the early foundation of country music, more commonly known as bluegrass to this day. Guthrie's plain-spoken style, combined with simple chords and arrangements, along with his take-no-prisoners attitude towards his relentless attack upon politicians and police, who were the Okies' favorite villains, would make him, in many regards, the first true punk musician over 20 years before rock and roll was invented and over 35 years before punk rock existed.